Welcome to season four of Hoda's Career Info, the program where career professionals from across the globe meet to empower you to succeed. My name is Hoda, and my guest today is Dr. Jill Frigario. In career development work, I think about myself as helping people to make connections between their present and their future, and also connections with other people that can help them because none of us are careering alone. That balance between seeing ourselves as relational and connected, as well as being autonomous and independent individuals. Often you can find something new even without having to change employer. Thank you for joining me in Hoda's Career Info, your career program where guests from across the globe share career tips and personal stories to help you successfully navigate your career and your story. Watch, listen, and learn. And remember, to like, subscribe, share, and follow Hoda's Career Info on social media for more career info. More importantly, make sure you have that very important career conversation with a career professional. My guest today, Dr. Jill Frigerio, is an associate professor in the Center for Lifelong Learning at the University of Warwick, who leads on the center's qualification in career studies and coaching. Prior to moving into a teaching role, Jill worked in career development practice and management, and most recently was the head of careers in the Center for Student Careers and Skills at Warwick. Jill's teaching interests cover theory and practice in career coaching, working with vocation and calling, as well as researching career development practice. Jill has research interest in intersectional approaches to women's career development, socially just careers work, and supporting practitioners as researchers. Jill is also the chair of NYSEC, a learned society for those working in career development. She has recently completed a doctorate in education, looking at a calling informed framework for career development practice, particularly focusing on women's experiences of work and faith. Thank you so much for joining me and Dr. Jill. Stay tuned as Dr. Jill shares her journey that led her to the career development field, the value of making connections, and the reasons career practitioners may forget to take care of themselves. Welcome, Dr. Jill Frigerio to Hodes Career Info. I appreciate your time and I appreciate the effort you put in responding and preparing the questions, and I cannot wait to hear your responses. Good to be here. Thanks, Dr. Jill. The first question I usually ask of everyone is, what term would you choose to describe the work that you do and how would you define it from your perspective? That's an interesting question. Thank you. And the term um, that I was thinking about in terms of what's important to me uh, was making connections. That's important, I think, to me in terms of how I see myself in many of my roles at work and also outside of work. Um, I guess in career development work, I think about myself as helping people to make connections between their present and their future, um, and also connections with other people that can help them because none of us are careering alone. And I think that that for me, that balance between seeing ourselves as relational and connected, um, as well as being autonomous and independent individuals um, is something that we really need to work with as we try and develop our own agency and the agency of the people that we're working with and trying to help in terms of their career development. They're not islands. They are connected to one another, but equally they have the ability to be agentic about their own futures, if you like. Um, so that's something that I like to keep in mind. 
And in my current role where I'm teaching and um, working in a kind of scholarly environment, as well as in a national role in the UK, I think about helping students to connect ideas with one another as they get to grips with them and then integrate that with their practice. And in terms of kind of moving scholarship forward, I place quite a lot of value on connecting people and connecting with people to new ideas and to potential collaborators, which is why I was so delighted to hear from you, Hoda. Thank you so much, Dr. Jill. And I love how you said uh, we don't, we're not careering alone. Mm. Uh, we're always, and that's that's so important to remember. And then mm. the value of networking, absolutely, for sure. My next question to you, Dr. Jill, is also a question that I ask of all guests is, can you please share with the audience your personal story and perhaps embedded with it, if possible, a lesson that you learned that you'd like to share by being on this program? Well, my story is that I was in a role um, where I was working on higher education research and policy. And through that job, I came into contact with the scholarly field of career development. And I found it really intriguing and um, I connected with it, you know. Um, and I realised that I'm fascinated by people's career stories. And I was all even before that, I was always asking people how they got into the jobs that... Um, that they were doing. Um, and in terms of my own role, I felt that I wanted to be doing something that was um, connecting me with individuals and helping them. I guess uh, one of my career anchors would be around service, as well as around technical competence and, and having a good understanding of a of an area of practice and a field of study. So um, I always think those two things drive me. Um, and so I was really lucky, actually. I was able to get a job training as a careers advisor in higher education. And I did my qualification on the job. So I was appointed unqualified. Those, you know, those jobs are, aren't always easy to come by. And so I did that role, really loved it, felt I'd found my home and progressed and found that I was training new staff and leading a team where we were thinking about evaluating the effectiveness of what we did um, and arguing, you know, presenting a, a, a solid case for the way that we were organising the service that I was running. After about 13 years in practice and in management, I got the opportunity to move kind of sideways into a teaching role. And um, so I made that change. It's very different being in an academic role than in a professional services role in a university, but I um, have loved it. And we, uh, my colleagues and I, we've grown the area, we've developed our course provision, diversified the range of courses and expanded the team. So I guess, in terms of a lesson, I have done all that with the same employer. So I've had a very stable career um, in terms of my employer at the University of Warwick, but I've been able to do lots of different things there. Um, so I think that's something that, you know, you can often you can find something new even without uh, having to change employer. Um, and it's just circumstantial for me that that's how it's gone, really. Um, I really love supporting practitioner research as um, a part of my job, and I really value that. And uh, that thing I was talking about before, about making connections between the different disciplines that we draw on in career development work and between scholarship and practice and policy and so on. Such a wonderful journey. And I, I like the message of uh, perhaps within the same employer, really look for opportunities and rather mm. than just jump uh, and go to a different employer because there's always opportunities to be had. And with your experience, Dr. Jill, and within the career education and with my personal push for career literacy, I want to see career education as part of the curriculum in K-12 and universities. What does career education mean to you? For me, it means all forms of learning about how we're doing that careering along with our lives. So there's formal bits of that that, you know, I, I've um, 
worked with where you might embed a particular module um, or particular um, learning outcomes that are work related within other forms of uh, other parts of a curriculum. Um, but I think it's also the informal and the non-formal learning, what we pick up from um, our peers, our families, our tutors, our bosses. Um, and those messages that we pick up, they they really shape how we see ourselves, you know, do, our self-efficacy, I guess, um, how much we might see the potential to overcome any barriers that we might face. Um, and a lot of that learning's tacit. So for me, I think the role of formal careers education is to make that explicit um, and then help them by helping people to make it explicit. We help them to explore possibilities and move forward. I love this definition and I appreciate you taking uh, me on to try to explain it more in detail. And I love where your thoughts went with it. And one of the reasons I reached out to you was an article that you wrote. The title of the article is Practitioner Wellbeing. And in it, you used a metaphor that involved a peacock mm -hmm. in referring to career development. Google Translate from the Norwegian version, a peacock only displays all the colors of its flamboyant tail feathers on certain occasions, but they are always a part of them anyway. I love this. And I want you to tell me more about it. Can you tell the audience what the article is about and how does the peacock fit in it? Okay, well, first of all, I should say that I didn't write the article in Norwegian. So uh, Google Translate has taken it back to pretty much the original English that I wrote. <laughs> so that's good. I, I thought you were in the UK and then I was like, why is it in Norwegian? So there yeah. is a link and uh, maybe you can provide it to me. Like I can share it with the audience as well and I can read it in English fully. Sure. Yeah. Um, I wrote it in English and then it was it was translated um, <laughs> well, that's for, very um, good. for the Norwegian that's very good. Um, <laughs> uh, Higher Education and Skills Directorate who run that particular forum. They do great, great work there. Um, yeah. So the peacock metaphor isn't mine. Originally, I got it from um, something I read about systemic coaching. Um, and really, the idea is that we are all the products of the systems that we work within. And uh, in the article, I write about the systems theory framework of Patton and McMahon, which is something that I've used quite a lot in my work and I use quite a lot in my teaching as well. So that's um, developed by Mary McMahon and Wendy Patton uh, from Australia. And it's a meta-theoretical framework. It kind of tries to pull together all the extant theory of career development, but also um, identify space for the development of new theories. Um, so there's a um, some more description about that uh, framework in the article. And um, I guess the peacock analogy reflects how we're all carrying things around with us, even if we don't show them. And what I was encouraging practitioners through that article to do is to think about uh, what's within their system, their individual system, their proximal, immediate social system, but also their wider environmental system um, that might be affecting how they turn up uh, within their work and how thinking about how a client system and your system might be interacting and kind of mutually influencing each other. So sometimes it's worth thinking about how our whole selves are uh, is present with the client and how the whole of the client is also affecting us. Um, and so in, in the context of practitioner well-being, that's something that I wanted to focus on, both in terms of the initial formation of practitioners when, when people are new to career development work, but also ongoing supervision. That's uh, very interesting. And I think, yes, that uh, really frames how practitioner well-being can be looked at as we move forward in supporting our clients. So one other thing I'd say in that article, as I, um, I was writing about vocation and calling as well, which is a particular interest of mine. And um, one of the components of calling that we need to pay attention to is that it can have some risks when we feel that 
our work really gives our lives a lot of meaning and purpose. Um, we are perhaps at a little bit of risk of over-identifying with work, um, neglecting other parts of our lives, um, and also maybe putting up with working conditions that aren't good for us, because that's the way in which we can do this work that means so much to us. Um, and that's what has an effect on well-being um, if we're not careful. So um, I was kind of starting to explore some of those ideas with, with practitioners there. So how do you suggest we take care of ourselves? and avoid these three um, issues? Well, I up. guess it's it's about boundaries and balance. I think ongoing supervision, whether that is something, if that's something that's provided for you in your employment setting, that's brilliant. But if it isn't, then um, some informal supervision arrangements with fellow practitioners, um, whether it be those who work in the same place as you or in different places, those relationships can be really helpful in um, in helping you to kind of maintain that that healthy perspective. I think there's a lot to be said for activities like um, journaling and um, uh, doing things that where you can perhaps step away from the working space, the space that you work in to get a different perspective. Um, so, you know, um, I guess a lot of it is a, is what we know about about well-being but it can be hard to follow up can't it so we just sometimes we need to take our own medicine I guess around work and well-being absolutely and I think it, it takes us back to making connections that you started with where you know if we have the right connections we probably are feeling supported mm. this takes me to the last question for you Dr. Jill and that again I ask all guests uh, because I continually encourage my young clients to take risks step out of their comfort zone so that they get exploring as we hope they would what are you doing that's getting you out of your comfort zone or any new opportunities that you're looking to embrace in the near future wow yeah um it's important it's taking our own medicine it's important isn't it yeah well i've recently completed my doctorate so being referred to as dr jill still taking a bit of getting used to congratulations um, on that thank you it was very definitely a stretch project um, um, and it was an action research project and I was looking at women and work and faith and calling and I used that systems theory framework that I was just talking about in my analysis as a way of ensuring that I was taking wider context into account. Lots of the literature on calling is very much focused on the individual and how they make meaning and, and define purpose. I wanted to look broader than that um, and through it I developed a, frame, a framework for practice that is got potential for use in uh, career development work um, and it's I guess a framework that opens a space for talking about calling in career coaching um, it sees calling as quite a complex thing it's multiple callings and multi-level sometimes we, we can feel called to something very specific other times it's much more general and we see calling as kind of always changing um we think we look out for that dark side thing that i was just talking about and acknowledge that it's got well-being implications and the framework also helps us to think about crafting and learning and um, sort of crafting towards experiences that that take us in the direction of our calling so the thesis ends with this framework and uh, I hope to find opportunities to use it. And as part of that, to kind of have the confidence to speak about the work that I've done and write about it and see how fellow career development people respond to it. So that's, I guess, the main thing that I'm challenging myself in 2024 to do. The other thing that I'm doing is that I'm the chair of NISEC, which is a UK based learned society um, of a group of between 35 and 40 fellows. We also have a, a group of international fellows as well. And uh, we, we organise a series of activities and we have a journal and I chair the meetings that, that bring all that together. And we're organising a two day conference in July. And uh, 
we have our events have been online during the pandemic. We did a, a very successful conference in 2019. That was the last one. So this is back to face to face, although we will have hybrid options. And it's the first time I've been kind of chairing a group that's organised an event like this. So that feels like quite a big deal, too. Oh, that's going to yeah. keep me busy, I think, next year. Absolutely. And I, I know by finishing a doctorate degree, you're usually not done. You're actually getting started taking all that in research and information you collect typically to you know work on it further so congratulations mm -hmm. on completing your degree again that's quite an accomplishment and as for NYSEC I would appreciate if you can share the links with me and wow for in-person conference in July so then yeah. I can put it in the comments section brilliant thank you so thank you so much for your time Dr. Jill I really enjoyed our conversation and I do look forward to further collaboration perhaps I'll see you at the conference in July well, that would be great. Come to Birmingham in July. <laughs>